السلام عليكم جميعا في سندس الدكتور اليوم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد الله سبحانه وتعالى thank you for this opportunity thank you and great society of Peter College for this event We speak because we know that there's a lack of speakers, but we have a, a knowledgeable jurist scholar you know, at his presence, then my speech will be just an addition. Uh, I'm only speaking after taking the permission from Samah Abad Dillah Sheikh Al-Araqi. Otherwise, I advise you at the end of the program if you have any questions to forward them to him. Having a Ashura Awareness Week, uh, programs about Ashura, uh, I'm quite happy to see them happening in London at the universities. And I think it's a, uh, a very good phenomenon that when there's a sort of a clash between two programs, one at, at Imperial and one at another university, that the people, the brothers and sisters at Imperial College decided to withdraw and let their brothers take that date and they will do another date. I think that's a very good sign of how we practice Islam. It's not about having a program, it's about promoting the message of the Prophet's family. So, uh, it's good even if, even if after I know that Imperial College has delayed their programs because of other universities. The other good thing is that we are having programs outside the first 10 days of Muharram. That is a very, very, very important thing. We fill the first 10 days, 10 nights with programs and majalis in every single Islamic center and university. And on day 11 or 12, it's back to normal. It's a very good thing that we're having programs one or two weeks afterwards. Now to the uh, talk, five points I'll talk about in the space of half an hour. The title is Lessons from Ashura, and uh, we all know that there are many lessons, and traditionally there are so many aspects covered in the first ten nights of Muharram. Our respected speakers talk about uh, one night for death, one night for martyrdom, courage, marriage, family values, that's very important. But I think that the important thing we, we have to do every single year in the space of those ten nights is to concentrate on the essential elements in our shura. Yes, we talk about things that are important for our society, our community, but there's an essential element in Ashura, in that revolution, that uprising, and that essential element is an Imam al Hussein as a leader, not as a marshal, not as a father, not as a he's as a leader, someone who decided to move at a certain time towards a certain place to lead a nation, that's a leader, that's, a, that's an essential element, a key element in Ashura. And I don't think it's fair for someone to give a negative criticism, for someone like me to stand up and say, I don't think what's happening in Majlis is right. Well, if, you are, uh, if you're up to that level of criticism, you should provide that alternative. And inshallah, in the space of half an hour, I, should, I will provide you with an alternative. I will talk about that essential element. I'm just, not just going to complain not about the, the, how, how we should improve the majalis. I will, talk, I will tell you the reality behind the, the leadership of Imam Hussain. Remember, positive, positive criticism. Not just complaining, complaining, complaining. Do something about it. Now, to understand this leader, Imam Hussain, looking at his revolution, his uprising, I remember three elements. 
described by Shaykh Mutahari about any revolution that's considered a successful humanitarian revolution. Three elements. And all of them were present in Ashura. That movement, that uprising, that revolution is deep. It has depth. It not, it's not just a, a, a product of a political disagreement. Depth. How do you know something is deep? You don't understand the reality of it at the meantime when it takes place. You only see the results come years and decades afterwards. That's depth. That's, that means the leader behind that movement, that revolution, had, vi had vision to the future. And people around him did not understand that. We describe that movement as a deep movement, as depth. Second thing is that any revolution or uprising, if it's a true revolution, it should overcome the word me. It should be for others. Third point, third feature, that, that revolution comes during an era of silence and acceptance. Silence and submission. If a revolution happens when everyone is revolting, Okay, that's a good revolution. If it's an uprising or a movement that happens when everyone is silent, then yes, it brings your attention. Why only him is moving? Death, beyond yourself, is for others, and at the time of silence, during the time of silence. And all, the, all those three features came in the revolution of Imam Hussein. And hopefully, hopefully, at the end of the half an hour, you can be, you'll be able to relate those three features to this revolution. Now, to understand Yom Hussein as a leader, forgive me, I'm not going to talk about Ashura and the event and everything and what happened to you. I, I assume you already know, or you can pick a leaflet from the soul outside. I'll just tell you about the leadership of Yom Hussein. To understand the leadership of Yom Hussein, you need to understand what was happening before he decided to move during those years and what happened afterwards. Now, what happened before the time of Mount Hussein's revolution, year 60, the Hijra, after the Prophet's migration? We tend to think about Mount Hussein as a suicidal leader. But I ask a single question. Did you know when did Imam al-Hassan was killed? When was he killed? What year? He was killed in the year 50, the Hijra. Ten years before the revolution of his brother. When did Muawiyah start to become a dictator and a tyrant? Year 50. So if Imam al-Hussein was a suicidal man, trying just to go there and jump in and shed the blood, why don't he do so year 50 the Hijra? Why did he wait 10 years? Year 60, at the end of it, at the beginning of it, 61, this first month of the year 60. No, those things, are, I'm not asking you for answer, I'm just asking you to, to study Ashura beyond the social aspect. Just look at the leadership. And you have to remember that and Imam Hussein did not revolt against Yazid only, because Yazid has only been in power for four months. And he decided to revolt first day Muawiyah died. So the revolution of Imam Hussein has got a bit of depth into this. Hopefully I'm not losing you, I'm just des describing you the scene before the revolution of Imam Hussein. Now, year 50 in Hijrah. Muawiyah realized that he lost the peaceful battle between him and Imam Hussein. One historical fact, brothers and sisters, Muawiyah's attitude towards Muslim was different between year 40 to 50 from that between 50 and 60. Now, if you read history, and I hope you do, and I know English sources are limited, but I hope you can gather that from going to centers and lectures. 
that we have incidents when Mu'awi was sitting in his palace in Damascus and a, a follower, a Shia Muslim, a follower of Ali ibn Abi Talib stands up and he starts describing Ali ibn Abi Talib. Describing the, 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 the leadership, the courage, the justice of Ali. And Mu'awi was silent, listening, sometimes even crying. How do you combine that attitude of Mu'awiyah to the attitude of Mu'awiyah towards people like Hijr? Hijr, one companion of Ali ibn Abi Talib, Mu'awiyah said, bring this man and kill him wherever you find him. How do you combine both? How could a man that sits on his throne, in his palace, in his capital, Damascus, listen to, one day he listens to a man praising Ali, and the other day he brings the companions of Ali to be helped there. Well, because those two incidents happened completely different times. Ali ibn Abi Talib was not here 40. I'm not here to talk about Imam Hassan's peace treaty, but for 10 years there was actually peace in Muslims' lands. Okay? And within those 10 years, Imam Hassan was alive, was in Medina. Muawiyah was following, following the, the, the conditions of the agreement. And that's when he allowed followers of the Amir Talib, known as Shia Muslims, to practice freely, to come to, the, to, the Mash, to Damascus, to promote their vision about Ali, true Islam. But he realized that he was, he lost the battle. He made a big mistake by accepting that peace treaty between him and Imam Hassan. So in year 50, he decided to change. How does he change? First thing, he kills Imam Hassan. And then, the start of a decade of tyranny. Kill all the companions of Ali. Don't allow the Shia Muslims to practice. Make sure you curse Ali ibn Talib every single Friday during the Friday prayers. Now, here's the danger, brothers and sisters. Some of your colleagues, when they're standing at Ashura, aware of the sweet stalls, they asked me, I said, some people come to us and say, we know about Imam Hussein's revolution. But what did he actually achieve out of this? They say, well, he actually saved the religion. What do you expect the next question to be? How did he save the religion? What are you talking about? Yes, it was a tragedy, but how did he save the religion? No, he saved the religion because and then lack of points, discuss. I don't blame you. I don't blame the centers. It's positive criticism, criticism hopefully. And inshallah, I will talk a bit about how one has been saved in the religion. It requires an understanding of Ali, who Ali ibn Abi Talib did after 25 years of not being a ruler. It requires an understanding of what Imam Hassan did. But let's concentrate on that last decade between year 50 and 60. When Imam Hussein was actually silent, he did not do anything. Not suicidal mission, just one guy. Brothers and sisters, I'm not going to prove it now, but ask me if you want to prove. The religion was revived by Ali and his companions in Kufa. Okay? Prior to Ali's leadership to Muslim nations, the, the narrations of the Prophet of Islam was prohibited from being pro propagated across the Muslim nation. The religion was the Qur'an, the Qur'an explained by the ruler. That was the religion. Now do you understand the danger behind that? You probably say, actually no, the Qur'an is a holy book and it's, it's, it's been saved from changes. No, no, do you understand the dangerous when you say the Qur'an interpreted and explained by the ruler? Do you understand the danger and the consequences when the religion of the master of all creatures, Muhammad sallallahu is taken from the ruler? Regardless, regardless of who the ruler is. That was the state of Muslims year 40, year 50, and on to year 60. One example I always mention is that even after the struggle of Hussein, to show you how, what was the danger that we are facing, I always say this because it's in, it's in, 
history books like Abu Dawa and Nihali and Kathir, and he says that uh, when Abd al Malik bin Marwan, a ruler that came, uh, was the second ruler after Yazid, uh, he was in trouble because of uh, some, some man occupied the Kaaba, the holy city of Mecca. And he was promoting that he should be the next ruler. So the Malik, so the every year Muslims are going towards him, they're listening to him, so I want to deviate them from going to Hajj. How does he do that? Muslims go to Hajj every single year. So do you know the submission to the ruler led to what? The submission to the ruler led to Muslims accepting the statement by the Muslim ruler to deviate from Hajj from Mecca to Jerusalem. If Imam Hussein did not, did not carry his revolution, you would be performing Hajj to Jerusalem because the ruler said so. Read history and understand the consequences. Now, submission to the ruler. The only carriers of the knowledge were the companions of Ali. Year 50, the most senior member of the house of the Prophet Al Hassan was killed. Now you have two options. Muawiyah is following the companions of Ali to kill them. Those companions, please substitute the word companions to the word carriers of Islam. They were the true carriers of the religion of Islam. They were the only community, knowledgeable community of Muslims, who have heard Ali ibn Abi Talib narrating the words of the prophets. Islam is built on two elements, Al-Quran and the words of the Prophet Year 50, the only carriers of the narrations of the Prophet were the companions of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Now Ma'awi is following them. Ma'awi is killing them. <coughs> so the leader, Imam Hussein now, has two options. He either fights a suicidal mission or waits. He decided to wait. Because if he was to fight, then you will end up losing all the carriers of the Sunnah. Because simply the, system, the state is much stronger than you. So you lose. You shed blood. Muslims will cry 14 centuries, but you lose the knowledge. You have no carriers of Islam. So you decided to wait. Kulu ahlas al occupy your homes. That was a statement to his followers, the Shia Muslims. Occupy your homes, year 50, and wait. Comes year 60 and has the leader moving. Now Hussein decided to take opportunity of the, of the death of the child of Muawiyah because the state is weaker, there is a new leader coming, he decides to move. Remember, it was not a suicidal mission. He should have done it 10 years before if he just wanted to shed his blood. He waited. Now you're 60. Now the state is weaker. Now the Shia of Ali, Shia Muslims, followers, companions, now they can breathe for a few months until things are back to an iron fist. Four months and a half, Imam Hussein decides to move. Now, the religion of Islam has been changed within that decade. So if you want to make the statement true, Imam Hussein said the religion of Islam, he has two options. He either starts teaching Muslims true Islam, or he takes an alternative. Well, this is, if he sits down and he gathers all the companions of his father and started preaching, they'll just come and behead them all. They'll just kill them. So what does he decide to do? He rejects the holiness, the sacredness of the ruler. Remember, the danger in year 60 was that the religion of Islam is the Qur'an and what? The words of the ruler. Quran, fair enough, but the words of the ruler they have to be rejected. And that's what Imam Hussein did. He said, I reject that authority of those rulers. This takes me to the second point, which obviously fair enough. He, we all know that he, by the way, we haven't yet answered how did he say this now. Just keep this, this question in mind. This brings me to the second point. Okay, so he decides to reject the ruler. But uh, 
Okay, and the people of Kufa supported him. But he knew they would betray him. So what did he go there? I said to you at the beginning, we are we're here to understand the leader. Why did he move within that space of time? And why did he move to that particular place? That's, that's the movement. Time, place, situation, you understand what happened. So when did he decide to, to go to Kufa? People say, okay, he knew the future. He knew that they would betray him. But he just moved to satisfy the... Uh, the, the, the element that uh, any leader, if he gets support, his support, he should respond. He should not waste the support, even though he knows the end. This is the second point. The people of Kufa. I have three comments to make, by the way. Exactly like I do in all the lectures of Samat al-Sheikh al Iraqi, I go to knowledgeable people and listen to them. So these words don't come from finally a medical student that comes from scholars, researchers, and evidence-based. But I'm not giving you a book here, I'm just giving you the main elements, features. Okay. I have three comments to make about this idea that he, he knew the people of Kufa, they're going to let him down, but he went towards them. Number one, if a ruler has to respond to his people even though he knows that they will betray him, then my question is, despite the difference, but well, the question is, why didn't Ali ibn Abi Talib agree to the support of Abu Sufyan? Did you know that after the death of the Prophet, when Quraysh, the tribe of the Prophet, decided to elect a different leader, Abu Sufyan, the most famous hypocrite we know, he went to Ali ibn Abi Talib and said, give me your hand, I'll make you the ruler, you have my support. Now, Ali ibn Abi Talib knows what Abu Sufyan is up to. You know he's going to betray him. You know he's not up to the and the support of the Imam and all that. So if Ali ibn Abi Talib did not agree with someone he doesn't trust, what did Malik Hussein agree to the people of Kufa despite knowing that he doesn't trust them? That's the first comment I make upon this propaganda that the people of Kufa did let Imam Hussein down. Second question is, all history books say that within the days of Ashura, Muhammad 61 in Hijrah, there were 10,000 men in prison. A question, how big was the army of, the, the army that fought Imam Hussein? Seven, twelve, thirty, I'm telling you, there, there were, there were 10,000 men in prison in Kufa on that day. Why were they in prison? Well, the people of Kufa, if you are to make, if you're going to make the statement that the people of Kufa did Imam Hussein down, what about those 10,000 men? Why were they in prison? And why did they break into prison two years afterwards and took revenge from every single killer who fought against Malik Hussein? My third comment is, those statements that the people of Kufa did betray Malik Hussein come, they were, <coughs> they were published <coughs> during the Abbasi Empire. I hope you have a bit of an understanding of the Umayyad Empire and the Abbasi Empire. Those books, history books that talk about that betrayal, they, 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 were, they were published during the Abbasi Empire. My question to you is, if Zalmar Khaliza, do you know who Zalmar Khaliza is? Okay, the American ambassador in Iraq. Come on, brothers and sisters, you have to follow me, please. If Zalmar Khaliza comes and says, I don't think that the followers of a debate in Iran are following the agreement about the nuclear weapons or whatever. Would you, would you believe? Would you believe a statement made by a man like Zema Khaliza? No, you wouldn't. Why? Because you know, he belongs to an institution of propaganda. So why do you believe the books written within, within the Abbasi Empire underneath the Abbasi propaganda about the people of Kufa? Did you know that the Abbasi Empire were frustrated from the presence of Imam Ja'far Sadiq alayhi salam? in Medina, the sixth Imam of the Shia Muslims, that they were searching for a figure to put him forward so he can compete with him. And that's how they brought Abu Hanifa. They were furious of the Imam and his followers. So to, to hit the Imam, they brought another figure. How do they hit the companions, the Ummah, the nation of Muslims that follow the Imam? Propaganda against them, against their ancestors. Their center was in Kufa. 
the center of knowledge has always been Kufa. <coughs> so they describe, okay, let's let's propagate the people of Kufa are cowards and they did betray the third Imam of the Shia Muslims. The conclusion after those three comments is supported by historical evidence. The people of Kufa did not let Imam Hussein down. Yes, Lady Zainab they said, I walked in the street and she saw those few tens or hundreds. Kufa was not a holy place, a, a, a place of angels. Yes, he did have cowards who did let Imam Hussein down. But there were thousands and thousands and thousands of Shia Muslim supporters of Imam Hussein in prison. And that's why they, they did not allow him to get into Kufa. Imam Hussein was heading to Kufa. What did he die in Karbala? They wanted him to stop from coming to his companions. If they knew that the people of Kufa would let him down, the whole city would be just like, okay, go, they should let him in. But they didn't. Because they knew he has, he has full support. Now, talking about the people of Kufa, history, Hussein, I can't ignore my third point, which happened this morning. The tragedy of the explosion of one of the descendants of Imam Hussein, the tenth Imam, Imam al Hadi, in Allah. This is my third point, and if everything is, everything else I've said before was theory, just wake up please for those points, okay? A few weeks ago, Western media attacking the master of all creatures, the Prophet of Islam. Today, the enemies of Islam, the enemies of within, and I'm not saying the occupation has no hand in this, but I'm saying that the enemies, extremist Muslims, if they call them, if they want to call themselves Muslims, I'll call them Muslims, fair enough. Muslim does not equal a good man. Muslim does not equal an angel. If someone says, I have an eyewitness that there is no God apart from Allah, Muhammad is a messenger and does not reject anything in Islam, he's a Muslim. If he's a killer, he doesn't change his status. So what? So what if he's a Muslim? So those extremists, those supporters of the ex tyrant Saddam, the occupation and their attack on the Prophet and now on one of his progeny, <coughs> raises the question, just like I was talking about the second point about the followers of Imam Hussein and Kufa, I'm talking about the followers of Ahlul Bayt, Iraq specifically, and the whole world generally. Brothers and sisters, please, Rajan, stand up, make a difference, and do something. Now, don't do, don't do like those idiots outside the Danish embassy, Europe is the cancer, the Islam is the answer, and some foolish statements, okay? Don't do that. I'll show you what. But I'm saying, after we were aff uh, offended by, by, by the attack on our prophets, because of those idiots, we started defending back. The media said, okay, so one magazine attacked you, and you went and you banned the embassies and you started promoting terrorism, now you have to answer us back. So we lost the one foot of, of, of strength we had in the whole thing. Alhamdulillah, our spiritual leaders, Maraja and Najaf, a few hours after the attack, they issued the statement. No attack on any mosque. No attack on any shrine that belongs to other Muslims. No attack to any political, religious figure. Within a few hours. End of story. So I'm not worried about that. But how about us? So we can't go to Salam Allah and defend the shrine. We can't do that. So what do we do? Well, if there is a, a, a demonstration next coming days, we should, we, should, we should all go to it. But is that enough? I'll tell you what to do. How many other Muslims friends each you each have? Five? That's pathetic. We live in a Muslim country. Ten? 
15, 20, 30? That's the number I expect that every single one of us will have. <coughs> Non-Muslim friends. We don't aim at converting everyone to Islam. We aim at from, of, of showing that we have some goodness we want to share with others. We have some truth that we want people to hear. Whether they convert or not doesn't matter. We want goodness for humanity. That's what we want. So those friends that you have, please, please promote the reality. What is the reality? The reality of the nation of Muslims. Now you probably say to me, you're talking about a particular sect, you're talking about the Shia Muslims. Fair enough. But this person is good. I'm not, I'm not saying the other person is wrong. But I'm describing you as a, a good phenomenon within the Muslim Ummah. The followers of Abu Bayt, the Shia Muslims. Please promote the reality of those people. How do you do that? Why don't you tell them about the last three years in Iraq? How, how could you explain to me that after decades of oppression on the majority of the people living at home, <coughs> they, they represent more than 60% of the population of Iraq? Decades of oppression, now they have a chance. In fact, not only they have a chance, they, they rule the country. They've got weapons, they've got strength, they've got numbers. Despite all that, brothers and sisters, how do you explain to me the fact that three years they've been bleeding? The majority of Iraq has been bleeding every single day. A car that explodes in a city full of Shiites. A political figure is killed, he's a Shia Muslim. A religious figure killed, a Shia Muslim. A Husayniya, an Islamic center, Mubarak, a Shia Islamic center. How do you explain the majority having the power, having the number, having decades of oppression, and they don't take revenge? Why? Three years is a long time, brothers and sisters. Three years is a long time. And they know that terrorist is coming from that city. They know exactly. They know he's hiding between those guys. And they don't take revenge. Why? What does it tell you about the manners of those people? And what do they get their manners from? From the religious leadership. And when did this religious leadership get those manners from? From the Prophet's family. So who is the true carrier of Islam? Who is the true carrier of Islam? Where do you find a phenomenon that, that represents Islamic ethics more than the phenomena of the Shia Muslims in Iraq? Majority with power, number, weapons, being bleeding every single day, and today is just an example, and they don't take revenge. What a beautiful phenomenon. What a demonstration of humanity. That I want you, please, to take this to your non-Muslim friends and tell them about it. You can do that. It's even better than demonstrating, having a demonstration outside any embassy. If every Muslim did that, the whole Britain will know that Islam is more than those Bin Laden, Zafari, and those idiots. That was the third point. We have two remaining points only. The fourth point, which takes me back to the leader, Imam Hussain, if you say to me that he moved, he, he planned everything, he was planning everything. So it, did not, it was not suicidal mission in year 50, in year 50, it was something he planned in year 60. He moved towards where he has support, where he knows he trusts the people where he has support. So why did he carry the mission all the way to martyrdom? If it, if it was not suicide mission. Well, martyrdom, you have to keep a balance. Martyrdom is part of his plan. To be killed is actually part of his plan. Not that he went without any support, without any strength, he chose a random location, but 
just as say Murtab al Askari says, one of our senior researchers, Islamic researchers, Islamic scholars, he says Imam al Hussein was not facing a problem with the ruler. It was not the problem of Yazid, a corrupt ruler. Because I'll ask, you, I'll ask you another question. Always when you read history, ask yourself a question. Were the rulers after Yazid better than them? We say Yazid was an alcoholic, uh, a tyrant, when well, we describe him, because the rulers that came after him, that our imams lived with, were they any better than Yazid? No, they weren't. So why, did they, why, did they, why didn't the imams revolt against him, against the ruler? Because the problem was not a corrupt ruler. Just as I said before, I said to you, how did Imam Hussein serve religion? Hopefully we're trying to reach a conclusion here. The problem was year 60, and if he did not do that, you will be doing the same. The religion was the Quran and the words of the ruler regardless. So the problem is not, is this a good or a bad ruler? It's a problem that you have, you have submission to the ruler. We do not have submission to the ruler. We have submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the carriers of his message, Muhammad and the people of the household of Muhammad. Not the ruler. So the problem was submission to a ruler, whether he was Yazid, someone slightly better than Yazid, someone worse than Yazid. So if that was the problem, the aim of Imam Hussein was not to become a ruler. The aim was not to replace the corrupt with a better one. The aim was to break that sacredness, that holiness that people have in their hearts for the ruler. He managed to do so. He demonstrated to them that those, those guys, their ancestors, are nothing but tyrants and criminals. And regardless of you're Muslim or not, if you see the grandson of the Prophet of Islam being slaughtered on the desert, you'll change your mind. You'll say, enough is enough. I'm not going to submit to this man. And that's exactly what happened. And that's exactly how I'm saying save the religion of Islam. When he took this element from the hearts of Muslims, take, take away this element that you submit to the ruler regardless. You submit to Allah and the messenger and the carrier of the message. When he took that away, he left his offspring, the nine imams after him, to correct the teachings. He did not have time to sit down and start teaching. He said, my prophet, my master, my grandfather said this, he did not say that. He left that for Imam Zayn al-Abideen, Imam al-Baqar, and Imam al-Sadiq who came after him, and they fulfilled their mission. After Imam al-Hussein took this element of full submission to the ruler from the hearts of Muslims, Muslims were looking around for the sources. His offspring represented the source of true knowledge. Imam al-Hussein had a mission. The mission was deep. The results of it did not come on the eve of the 11th, not on the same day. It was beyond his own self. It was for, this, for the benefit of mankind. And it was, it came during its, in a time of silence. No one else revolted against his except him. It was not a general uh, rejection that he took the opportunity of. That was the fourth point, and I hope to get a bit answer on the other question and answer session. I hope to can answer this statement. How did Imam al Hussein save the religion of Islam? By just dying on the plains of Karbala. After that long plan to take, to withdraw that element from the hearts of Muslims is a big, big achievement. Otherwise, we today, we would have another different Islam. Final point, I would say, which is a question, the fifth point, and I'll finish. The question sometimes our Muslim uh, brothers and sisters ask us, this is a very good point, not particularly with Ashura. It's about this uh, fact of being the son of Ali ibn Abi being the son of the prophets. I mean, when you read the Ziyar, don't you notice that at the beginning, we send salutations and peace upon you, the son of, of the messenger, the son of Fatima, the son of Ali. And we, we always repeat this word, whether it's Imam Hussein or the other Imams. 
always. But we all know that uh, you can't inherit your faith. Just because you're a good God doesn't mean your offspring will be good believers. We all know that. And living in London is just a proof. So why do we concentrate on this? Well, first of all, the text of the Ziyarat, of those, uh, those dialogues we have with, with the Imams, came from the progeny of the Prophet himself. So we submit, but there's a point behind it. Just quickly. Two comments I shall make upon this idea of the son of the Prophet, the son of Ali. And so what if he's the son of the Prophet? Muslims have only two evidences against the fact that if you are a good guy, your offspring will be bad. What are they? From the Quran. What's the famous example of a prophet who is progeny? The son of Noah. Okay? So chapter 11. Talks about how Noah was having a dialogue with one of his sons, not all of them. The rest John. One of them came to the, come to me, join me, and he said, no, and you all know the story. And there's another verse in the Quran that talk about a, a religious couple who were talking to their son, O oh son, Ya Bunaya Waylaka Amin, join us in faith. He said, I will not. So two verses in the Quran that say, just because you're a prophet or a religious couple does not mean that your offspring will be good or pious. So, What's, what's, what's the point we are saying that Imam Hussein is the son of the prophets? I'll tell you what. A quick, a quick look at the Quran. A very, very quick look. will reveal to you at least, at least 14 verses that say, remember, two saying, if you're a biased man, your offspring not necessarily biased. There are at least 14 that say, if you are biased, your progeny will be pious as well. If you are a believer, your progeny will be believers. Do I have time to read? I'll just read the English text on some of them. Just to show you. Don't pick one verse of the Quran and start you know, basing a theory. Chapter 13, verse 23. Gardens of residence, they will enter them with whoever was righteous among their fathers, their spouses, and their descendants. So the descendants go into heaven with their fathers. Okay? Chapter 25. And those who say, O oh Lord, grant, grant us from, from amongst our wives and our offspring comfort to our eyes and make us a leader of the righteous. This is just any righteous man. So did Muhammad not pray that, O oh Lord, grant us, from, grant us from among our wives and our offspring comfort to our eyes? You see that the Quran is, is hitting on this element that righteous man will pray for righteous progeny offspring and he will get it. <coughs> Chapter 40, verse 8, O Lord, is these the angels talking, O Lord, and admit them to the gardens of residence which you have promised them and whoever was righteous amongst their fathers, their spouses and their offspring. Righteous offspring. And I'm not going to read the fourth one which I got, but there are 14 verses that talk about that. Apart from the Quran, the final point is in medicine, just if you don't, if you don't want to listen to the Quran, in medicine they teach us that the offspring of someone will be affected by two elements. What are they? Not just the medicine, even if you do psychology, it's so Genes and their environment. That's what formed the child, <coughs> genes and their environment, the environment that he was born in. So Muhammad, the master of all creatures, Ali, the genes and the environment, they will not take place, they will not take an effect on Hussein, the imams of Hussein, amongst the descendants of Hussein. My sisters, please uh, remember your offspring even before you have it. Please, plan ahead. If you're here to, 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 to learn a lesson from Ashura, Learn a lesson about planning your head. Read 
the letter of rights by Manzain Adi about the rights of your offspring. Please do not act and pretend that you are good to your parents when you have children. When we have children and we go to visit our parents, we act in a very good manner so we can teach our children. Brothers and sisters, children are very clever. They will notice that you're acting. If from now, before you have offspring, you plan your life, goodness to your parents, respect, which is things we, we lack in our British society, unfortunately, it becomes a habit and your children will learn from you. Please, please, plan ahead. Know how to raise a child before you have a child. And learn from Hussein to plan ahead. And learn that he was a leader, a wise man, it was not a suicidal mission. And if you're going to support him, support him with acts, not just tears. Go and tell your non-Muslim friends about the Shia Muslims. Tell them about their manners. Tell them, describing the majority and the carriers of weapons and authority, they did not take revenge, and they will not take revenge. Why? They simply, they are human and true Muslims. Salaam alaikum. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Sayyid Hassan, for this enlightening speech, which covered a very broad uh, spectrum, I should say, uh, from how and why Imam Hussain went to to actually, uh, he knew that what, what will come about him and his family by he went ahead and what led to the biggest sacrifice in history actually and how we should nowadays try to create awareness between ourselves and others of uh, what the message was and as we all know the message lives on. Now we will have about 10 minutes, a 10 minute break, I said that. Initially I said 15 minutes, but I have to cut it short to 10, so that we can cover the next speech as well. So, refreshments for the brothers is in that corner, and for sisters, if I'm not wrong, it's at the far end. So, uh, have a 10 minute break, and then we shall start again. in Rom, which is an establishment which is involved extensively in research, Islamic research and publications. He is also uh, the, one of the heads of inter the International Abbate uh, Assembly. Uh, Aytalan Araki has had many books published as well uh, in English, for example, the Islamic Awakening book, which you can go and read, and also in, in Farsi and Arabic as well in different books, for example, an introduction to imam and leadership and an insight into Islamic spiritual spirituality. So, the title of uh, Atalaki's speech will be, uh, as you can see, a short analysis on the consequence of Imam Hussein al Salam's uh, uprisal, and I invite Atalaki to
having Imam Hussein is not simple choice like any other ordinary social or political event. To the limited extent of their connections in their own time and place. Rather, it was an unusual incident which arose from pure human nature. It's why with the essential human identity for all time and place. From this, we see its message. So this is all geographical, historical, and ethnic aristocrats and barriers, awakening the sleeping conscience and provoking <coughs> the enlightenment of hearts to defend and support justice and virtue in their society. Today, in the age of the revolution of information technology and globalization, the message of Imam Hussein Salah has gradually started to be widespread throughout the world. Although it is still famous and helpless as it was during the last centuries. Our moral conscience and Islamic responsibility called us to deeply understand this message and clearly convey to others to follow its guidance and pursue its goal. In this speech, we will firstly try to summarize the story of Hussein's family after his martyrdom, and secondly to analyze in a brief the outcome and result of Imam Hussein's uprising, and finally to clarify its main message to the present generation and responsibility concerned that has been borne by them in this regard. First of all, the brief story of Imam Hussein's family after Ashura. At sunset on the day of Ashura, although the sacred bodies of Hussein and his companions silently and calmly lie on the dark, dry dust of Kabbalah's visits. However, they inflamed a vast strong storm not only against Yazid or the Umar regime, but also against all types of wrong values such as injustice, oppression, discrimination amongst many others. One of the main aspects of Imam Hussein's uprising was that it was not limited to any type, base, race, or any other kind of boundary. This message calls to all of mankind breaking the barriers, crossing the thick walls of neglect, selfishness, arrogance, awakening the sleeping conscience and reviving the dead spirits and encouraging them to stand <coughs> against evil by oppression and to carry out their responsibility towards God and the people. The day of Ashura was a very difficult and miserable day of bloodshed for Imam Hussein's camp. In particular, for the women and children longing for their dear ones prevented them from considering that all the troubles they face, such as starvation, tears, and helplessness. Those lonely people out on the battlefield, surrounded by their enemies, and then only <coughs> killed, were as the killers had witnessed, the most unique and 
best people in the world. At last, Imam Hussein, and his faithful companions were beheaded. And then the sacred bodies were trampled upon by the enemy's horses. The shining, pure heads were put onto spears and presented to the tyrannical regime. After the martyrdom of Mount Saint and his devotees, the flame of his enemies' eye still did not settle. They attacked the terrified and helpless orphan children and women, beating them, setting blaze to and plundering their tents. When darkness covered the aggrieved desert of Karbala, the night of the eleventh of Muharram, no glimmer could be seen except the remaining fire of the burned tents. The day of the eleventh of Muharram was the starting point of a new movement prepared by Imam Hussein's martyr and led, and led by his sacred sister, Lady Zaydah the great and most powerful lady in the history of Muhammad. <coughs> the caravan was ready to carry the divine captives, the progeny of the greatest prophets of God. From Kabbalah to Kufa and then to Muslims, Shah, crossing many cities between them. When the Kabbalah arrived in Kufa, people were gathering at the entrance of the city waiting to see the first captives, Lady Zainab Salaam started her astral speech addressing the Kufi people where she said, Praise be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and divine blessing be sent on my grandfather Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his <coughs> exemplary descendants. All people of Kufa do shed tears, may your tears never dry off. Anyway, I can't uh, carry on the speech of Zainab uh, Salaam because it's some wrong. I take part of it. Anyway, the caravan of the captives with the sacred heads of the martyrs came to Damascus, the capital of the Amawi Empire. <coughs> when it arrived in Yazid's cohort, his arm presented the sacred head of Imam Hussein to the Chinese of Yazid, putting it in front of him, where he then arrogantly and proudly started hitting the sacred lips of Imam Hussein Salaam with his stick singing a well-known poem where it said the tribe of Hashim played by the rain and did not come any angel and not any revelation in the sense. Zainab Salaamu stood up delivering an important speech. Her speech was followed by Imam Sajjad Imam Sajjad's speech. This greatly shocked the people of the Muslims and the oppressive regime of Yazidis. Its news spread all over the Islamic world. In these speeches, the realities of Hussein and his objectives were explained to the general public and the oppressive and criminal nature of the Omar regime was revealed. 
something which was impossible at the time on the sky of this madness. The movement started after the event of Ashura by the followers of Hussein ibn Ali Although it started from Damascus and Kuf never stopped in any time or place. This movement was the movement of the awakening of mankind, a movement that continues to this day. Second point. The society in which Hussein ibn Ali said rise the flag of his rising was one that had lost all the necessities of the society, the spirits, and the soul. Only an uprising like the one of Imam Hussein or the one which were carried out by his followers after him could have brought about the possibility of a new life in that society. The sociological aspect of the Holy Quran prophecies, the mission of the human society to establish a state based on virtue and justice by endorsing the leadership of the prophets and fellow imams and their righteous representatives, the Almighty says in the Holy Quran, indeed, Indeed, we sent our messengers with the clear proofs, and we sent down with them the book and the scale that people might establish themselves in justice. Surah Al Hadith, verse 25. According to the sociological understanding of the Holy Quran, the existence of mankind on earth is only justified through two main goals, establishing justice and virtue resulting in the formation of a society with a just composition based on virtue that can materialize the ultimate goals of human creation. From the viewpoint of organic sociology, the existing universe is a raw material that must be developed and nature by humans is powerful the responsibility assigned to them by being the Almighty's vice parents or Almighty's presenting in the earth. For mankind to be able to evolve and flourish in the universe, it is necessary to first establish justice and and integrity in the human society, where this can only be accomplished under the obedience of religious leaders and the establishment of a just and righteous state under their leadership. Through mankind's commitment to the teaching of the holy prophets and through comparing the reign of rule, power and leadership in a human society to just a ruler who include the prophets then the infallible imams and after them are the representative of the infallible imams, namely the just scholars of religion. A state of justice and integrity can be founded on earth where mankind accomplishes its true merits and quality. In accomplishing these merits, the world surrounding humans will also achieve their true merits 
using human efforts and ventures. From the sociological viewpoint of the Holy Quran, considering the fact that the system of creation and management of the universe is based on justice, righteousness, and which the human society cannot be an exception in this universal principle. Therefore, human society must fall to one of two situations. First, through establishing a just and righteous state in human society, where individuals are able to, to ascertain justice and virtue in their lives by following the religious leaders and abiding by the order of God. As a result, the virtuous and just society will be formed in a a situation where, as a result of different factors, the evil elements in society will exercise authority over the fortunes of mankind and spread oppression and prejudice in the society. Such a, such a, such a society can only have the chance of survival and continued existence when it has the potential for establishment of justice. That is to be like a grain that in the course of time could turn into a just and virtuous society. Therefore, only according to one of these two assumptions can the existence and persistence of human society be just, justified, justified? Either society, which is already ruled by justice and virtue, or has some chance of establishing a just and virtuous society. Therefore, if a society arrives to the point where it lacks either of the above mentioned conditions can no longer be, say, have a justified cause for existence. And as a result, it will be subject to destruction and demolition. After the martyrdom of Amir al Salamullah, the certain conditions arose that caused the displacement of the just although we stayed under the leadership of Imam Mushtaba and uh, came to power at turns and oppressed Bani Umayya under the leadership of Muawiyah. By the death of Muawiyah and the coming to power of Yazid, not only oppression and tyranny was sustained, but if his government was detained and established, the chance for justice in the human society would have been negated forever. It would have been such that oppression and crime, discrimination and tyranny and immorality ruled the human society forever where gradually morals would have left society forever and immorality replaced the high values and justice and virtue forever. This is described in the Holy Quran of a prophet Nuh's society before the storm. A society that not only was ruled by oppression and terror, but has also destroyed any chance of establishing justice and justice in the society. The Holy Quran in describing the horrendous situation in Nuh's society says, Nuh said, 
على الارض من الكافرين ديارا انك ان تذرهم يضل عبادك ولا يلد الا فاجرا كفارا. Nous cette law leave none of the unjust ones, not a single dweller alive on earth. Very. If you leave them, they would leave your servant side, and they would not beg it, but immoral ingrates. The verse 26 and 27, chapter 2. In this verse, the reason that the stone destroyed new society is described. And that is not only that the society was unjust and an admirer of crime, but it got to the point where all its future offspring were also subject to the same pitch. Therefore, the likelihood of justice had vanished and so was subjected to destruction and arbitration. According to this principle, societies, just like individual humans, will encounter death in the state of a social death, destruction and annihilation of that society is post ten. According to what is obtained from the historic resources, the condition of the Islamic society and subsequently all human societies at the time of their rule by Muawiyah and then Yazid reached a status that if persisted, resulted in the destruction of the Islamic society and after that the whole human society. With his sacred sacrifice, Hussein Ali Salamullah, I awakened the sleeping conscience of the human and ignited flame of eternal life in the human society, as a result of which until today, wherever oppression and tyranny exist, that also exist, that also exist a revoking power who stands against that, against that oppression, and continues that resistance until attaining victory over oppression and terror. We witness this lively spread against oppression and promoting oppression in today's human society. Today, we witness, despite all the power and authority that the tyrants, powers, have attained over the affairs of human society, and despite the absolute and perilous power that they assume for themselves, the movements promoting justice and integrity have risen against them, standing firm and resisting their evil intentions and never surrendering to the accomplishment of evil powers victory. <clears throat> this anti oppression spirit is undoubtedly the effect of the Husseini rise. Hussein ibn Ali gave a new life to the human society. After the martyrdom of Hussein ibn Ali, the awakening movements that were endorsed by those remains of Hussein ibn Ali, firstly inspired, inspired the Kufis to rise against the government and the rising of the Tawabin repentance. In Kufa was the first outcome of Hussein's uprising after his method. After the rising of Tawabin, the people of Medina united, and after that, the rising 
continued in different parts of the Islamic world, particularly in Kufa and Hijaz. And they continued until the collapse of Umayya chain. After the collapse of the Bani Umayya ruling and the establishment of the Bani Abbas government, when it was recognized that the Abbasi caliphs practice the same oppressive or cruel methods in the Islamic society, the chain of uprisings and rights began and in several parts of the Islamic world, including Egypt, Sabzawa and Hilla, they resulted in the establishment of Shia governments who tried to relaunch justice and virtue in the Islamic society and it satisfies the true ruling of religion as mentioned in the Quran and Sunnah. During the eras of the Egyptian ruling, several governments have ruled over Egypt. But the period when the representatives of Imam Ali, like Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr and Malik al Ashtar, and Qais ibn Sa'd, of Imam Ali were ruling Egypt, and after that, the rule by Fatimid Yun have been revealed as the best epochs of the Egyptian history. From what was mentioned, we conclude that the condition of the Islamic society and the human society at the period of the rule by Yazid ibn Muhammad was such that the human society was heading towards a definite demolition. And it was only through Hussein's uprising that a new life was injected into the human society. And the anti oppression spirit and the spirit of promoting justice was given a new life. And until today, the human society is in debt of Hussein. The third point What's our duty towards the uprising of Imam Hussein? The foremost responsibility which is upon us and all mankind in relation to this divine uprising is to get to know it. What was right in this short and abstract discussion was only a very minor part from the realities that exist within the movement of Imam Hussein Salaam. Imam Hussein movement is the endless source of knowledge, teachings, and values. By getting to know the prize of Imam Hussein, we can find the best models for all dimensions of man's life, whether it being individual, social, political, uh, or moral dimension. The individual social morality effect of Hussein and his followers is unique in the world. The political and humanistic dimension of the personalities of Hussein and his followers is a boundless sea of the greatest values. On one hand, we see that enemies of Hussein close the supply of water to Hussein and the people who contained him. And they even forbid water for the children of Imam Hussein. Salaam On the other hand, we see the way which Imam Hussein Salaam treated the army of Yazid at the first contact which they had with the army of Yazid, Imam found the people of Yazid to be thirsty. He ordered his followers to generously provide the people and their horses with water. To understand that 
a member of the army Yazid says I was the back of the crowds and by the time I reached I found everyone had drunk water at this moment Sayyidina Ali noticed that I was looking for water So he went and brought the water to skin and held it on my mouth until I drank and felt satisfied. This great morality shows the best model for a great behavior and can provide the human throughout time with the best teaching. After the martyrdom of Hussein, the first thing that Zainab did was that she went to the place of martyr and laid hands under the holy body of Hussein and said, Oh Allah, please accept the sacrifice from the household of the Prophet. After that, throughout the period of captivity, of women and children of Husseini household, despite all the suffering and difficulties imposed by the enemies of this holy household, Hesse does not know of even a word that hinted impatient or upset being said by any member of the Husseini household, even the small children. When the captives were taken to the palace of Ibn Ziyad, the oppressive governor of Kufa, in order to hurt Zainab, he said, Did you see what Allah did to your brother? And Zainab in response said, Allah raised my brother in his accompaniment to the highest level of martyrdom. Martyrdom for us is a great divine generosity and we are proud of martyrdom in the way of Allah. And shame and disgrace is upon the people whose hand has been polluted with the blood of innocence. This bravery and patience and assistance is the greatest and the most suitable model for all oppressed human beings. These are only the minor parts from the thick book of the teachings of the great Husseini revolution. By learning and, and preparing and propagating these teachings and putting them in action, we can often wait for the justice seeking movement all around the world of mankind and bring the human sight closer to the day in which there will be no sign of oppression and justice would rule upon the whole world under the leadership of infallible Imam, the awaited Savior, Imam Mahdi, sallallahu alayhi Thank you to Ayatollah Rahman for his announcement to speak. As Allah started with the introduction of how the message was spread from you know from the moment that the sun set, the message started to get spread, went down to the city of Kuba and then the Damascus, and from then on until today, the message of Imam Hussein and his loyal and faithful companions has been uh, spread. Ayatollah uh, continued with categorizing uh, society 
and looking at how societies are led and what on what they are based, and that whatever society we're living in, the message of Karbala and Imam Hussein is always uh, has always got to be rem remembered because even if it's led by an evil leadership within us, we have and we must have what uh, Imam Hussein had, which was saying no to oppression. Uh, also, just to mention at the end, was uh, and how we should learn from these people. How we, how we should we uh, how should we learn from Imam Hussein and take Imam Hussein and Hazrat Zainab and Imam Sajjad and all the companions and the Ahlul Bayt as models of how we should live. And anyone who, should, who is oppressed should take them as an example and a model to follow where I'm sure loads of you have actually heard from Gandhi that he, within the Indian Revolution, said that this is what I learned from the saying of the Muslims, this revolution. So, you know, we try to create awareness and spread the message. Thank you all for coming today. Uh, thank you to the next one like once more and say that same as well. Uh, we will be having a question and answer session straight away uh, for about 15 minutes, if that's okay. So, if you have any questions, uh, there should be paper going around soon. Write your papers or just simply ask them. So, I invite Seth Hassan to join me as well. Okay. So it's more about our lucky. If you just louder, just louder. Okay. So, uh, the question is about uh, Muhyiddin al-Arabi. My question is, is it safe to read his books because he was a Sunni? Yes, he was a Sunni, but we believe he was a Sunni in the first part of his life. He became Shia. And uh, we have several uh, texts of Muhyiddin Arabi that shows that show he was a restaurant sheep. Okay. Yeah. Several texts. So for example, Susu Hekam, is it safe to read that book? Yes, but, but uh, Muhyiddin Arabi is a special personality. He is I don't think that uh, the ordinary people can benefit from his book because his uh, method is, uh, is uh, special. special. No one can understand what he said except who, who are specialists in, in Irfanic method and philosophy as well and he has a very complex method in speech and writing and he has a special even special uh, uh, special word special uh, terminology yeah uh, there's another question uh, so it's regarding uh, Omi Kulsum, the daughter of uh, Imam Ali and uh, the question is that uh, what role did she play within the, the whole tragedy of Kabbalah and why isn't she mentioned as much as has a designer? So, exactly. Yeah. I think Imam Ali Salam was was Zainab itself. We don't have two daughters of Imam Ali in the crowd. Uh, we think that Umar Kulthum is the Kunya of Zainab. Because, you know, in Arabic, uh, in Arabic language, in Arabic uh, society, they use always Kunya. Kunya means uh, 
have a title, yeah, title with Ibn or with Abu. With Ibn or with Abu. It's this is a special title. For example, Imam Hussein, his name is Hussein, but his kunya is Abu Abdullah. Imam Amir Mu'min, his name is Ali, but his kunya is Abu Hassan. And Zainab, her name was Zainab, and her kunya was Umm Kulthum. That because of which you, you don't, you don't see any any race of the name of Umm Kulthum. We don't see any name of Umm Kulthum. What was her name? And what was Zainab, uh, for example, Kunya? No. I think, I think Zainab and Umm Kulthum was not, were not two two personalities. They, they were one person. They, in Karbala, Imam Hussein has just one sister, which is Zainab. And her, and her uh, Kunya was Umm Kulthum. Okay, uh, go to another question. Any question on the floor? Just one sister. You have to be loud, though. Okay. Uh, my question is to Brother Hassan. Uh, you said that uh, Imam Hussain is an uh, It changed people's mentality by taking off the, the ruler's holiness from people's hearts. Now, after the death of Imam Hussain, why people kept these, these oppressive rulers? Why they didn't uprise against them? Why? why you know, do you say that? <coughs> there will never be a revolution or an uprising or a social movement that's accepted by all people. But we understand that the movement of Hussein was accepted by the majority. Now, allow me to draw this distinction between uh, Shia and Sunni Muslims, even though I'm not in favor of that. But I would say is that after that of Hussein, even those who did not follow the school of the Prophet's household, even those who did, not, who did not go to the Imams and learn from them. If you're a label that as Muslims, you can, even then, they deviated from taking the Islamic teachings from the ruler to scholars. In fact, just a little bit, I was in Sheikh al Arabi discussing that before the revolution of Hussein, uh, it was the ruler, the source, and the ruler. After the revolution of Hussein, even ordinary Muslims, even though they did not follow Imam Hussein, they the, the, the whole, this whole progeny, they have this uh, mentality that that's it. We're not going to take the teachings from him, we look for someone else, other scholars. But I, I totally agree with you, even until today, the catastrophe of the Arab states come from this root, that's acceptance of, of the unjust rule. Alhamdulillah, Thankfully, they're not taking their religion from him, which is great. But they're accepting it, and they're submitting to it. And that's a, a phenomenon for a lot of Muslims, unfortunately. And alhamdulillah, with your help, with your voice, and with your support, with Ashura Awareness Weeks, you can try to change that. Apparently, they, uh, this person who's asked the question said that, why is it must have to fast till noon? Yeah, there is a long story. <coughs> you know, in the school of Sunni people, they didn't write the Rasulullah's traditions until the second century. Because, as I said, this is a very, very important and long story. Very important. Because the first Khalifa and second Khalifa and third Khalifa, they abounded writing anything, any traditions from Rasulullah And they always people even to 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 tell or to talk about the traditions of Because this reason, because they did that, 
بني اميه ذا ذا رجيم بني اميه تايد تو تو تشينج ذا سنه اوف رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم تايد تو تشينج ذا تديشن اوف رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ذي كرييتد باي ذير مان ذي كرييتد ا لوتس اوف روايات ا لوتس اوف تديشنز And some of the traditions were created by them, the tradition about the fasting of Ashraf. This is tradition created by the Bani Umayyad's men, because they tried to make, to make the day of Ashura the, the, the day of ceremony, the day of festival day. They decided to do, they decided to show the day of Ashura as a festival, as the religious festival. They created this Ruaya for that reason. And it's not, not right. And we have a lot of uh, searches about this, this method. And they, uh, they affirm that the fasting of the day of Ashra is Makru, is not, not uh, uh, rising. Uh, another question for, I think, about Sayyid Hassan. And that uh, is it right that we commemorate the martyrdom of the imams more than the martyrdom of death of the prophets? I don't actually agree with that, but can you enlighten us? This is right that we is do. Is it right that we do? No, it's not right that we do. Uh, if, if you come to our centers, if you come, then you will see that on every occasion when there's the death of the prophet of Islam, the Zahra, Ali ibn Abi Talib, all the imams, we have programs, we have lectures. And if you go online, we'll find different lectures at different times to represent those occasions as well. Imam al Hussein has a special status, not given by us, by his grandfather. Uh, his revolution has a special, had a special effect and continues to have, um, has one on us. Um, and uh, 10 days, yes, 10 days, because of this is a traditional way of doing it, but we don't ignore with his master and our master of the Islam. Come to our centers and you'll see. And I have to say, being at your age, my age, it's now your responsibility to hold those events. Don't just be negative and say, well, our centers do not commemorate the British Republic. Why don't you do it? And I'm sure you do. I'm sure one day I'll hear about the Hanbei Society in Imperial or City or Queen Mary's, where they have an event about the death of the Prophets, or Ali ibn Abi Talib or others. We're not waiting anymore, are we? That's my answer. Another question. Uh, it's written in Persian, actually, if I couldn't read that. <laughs> the question is, uh, those, uh, if you all remember, on the night of Ashura, Imam Hussein dimmed the lights and said, whoever wants to leave, leave, uh, leave. So the question is that those who left, would, uh, have they sinned and would, would they be forgiven? Though, to be honest, that's kind of a dodgy question because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decides who gets forgiven or etc. So just wondering, is it, was that a sin and would, would they get forgiven? No, it was a sin. Yeah. Because uh, Imam himself allowed them to go and the night they, they have to come to him they have a duty to come to him but at the, at the night when he allowed them to go they could go <coughs> even uh, in the sharia they can go without any sense let's see Uh, another question, Ayatollah Rafi again. 
is that you said that uh, we have to set up social justice within the world today. How, by what means can we actually go about that? How can we, as a person, as someone who's studying in university, go about setting up social justice? You know, how we can promote this message? Yeah, it's quite sad. That's a long discussion. <laughs> but uh, if the oppressed people come united at first <coughs> and learned their responsibility, I think they could do lots of things. Another question from Sayyid Hassan. Are there questions on the floor, by the way? Again, sorry. Uh, one brother in the front. Yeah, I'm um, called Sayyid Hassan. Um, I just want to clarify something and then ask you a question. Um, you said that Hussein, El Hussein knew that the people in Kukul um, would not be able to help him because the majority of them were in prison. Is that right? Hussein, no. Hussein knew there was support. There was support, <coughs> but they could not help him because they were the majority of them were in prison. That's true. Um, you said you quoted the figure thousands, ten thousand. Ten thousand. Um, was the, well, the question I put past is that was there actually that many people, and were there actually that many prisons in those days for that many people to be in prison? And where is the figure from? I'm just interested. I think that's true. The population of Kufa. Um, we have to remember the whole of Iraq, I'm sure I will argue it correctly, had only uh, Basra, the city, Kufa, and then even Wasif was built afterwards. There was no Baghdad, no Karbala, nothing. So only two cities in the whole of Iraq. So population of 10,000 would be quite acceptable. Uh, remember that the Prophet of Islam, uh, when he marched from Medina, as far as Hajj, he had a few thousand. So a few thousand, for that number to live in one city, especially Kufa, being a capital at that time, prior to that time, of course, and being one of only few cities in Iraq, it's quite possible. Uh, so, yeah, 10,000 would be an well, acceptable number. And, and so you said that they were all in prison, were they all in Kufa, they were all prisons. Oh, so the, about the, uh, I remember uh, Sheikh al Wal had a uh, very interesting paper written about prisons in Islam. And the first establisher of them is Imam Ali, if I'm not wrong, in Kufa when he was there. Um, so the institution of prison as punishment was established during the time of Imam Ali and Khalid. So to take those men into their it's quite, it has been about 20 years since his death. So, we were established two decades before the time of that time. The last question of the floor. Sorry, just to clarify the special justice question. Could you just be a bit louder, please? Right, just to clarify the special justice question. Right. I don't know how to Basically, the question is that uh, about promoting justice and uh, promoting justice by our own message, which is Islam, if I'm, if I'm not wrong. Uh, is it right to impose Islamic law to others? Or, for example, she gave example, the sister gave example that is it, is it right to uh, set up Islamic State and impose Islamic laws to everyone, whereas everyone might not be Muslim? Um, uh, Islamic theory of, of uh, society justice is no one, no even a lot of times, impose people to choose uh, to choose the faith, to choose the justice, or to 
to to follow Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam to follow uh, the infallible commands. Allah subhanahu wa said, "Ma anta alayhim bi musaykir, ma anta alayhim bi jambar. Walau shaa rabbuka la amana man fi al-ardi kulluhum jami'an anta tukruhu al-nas." La ikrar. Anyway, there are many verses in Quran that uh, said we don't impose people to accept our plan but we have responsibility people have responsibility to accept this there are two ways we Allah subhanahu don't impose people don't push, push, don't ask people to 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 choose um, uh, the Islamic uh, law, but they have responsibility to to accept and to do as the Islamic. Law. And we th we think that because of the nature of human. If we can explain, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explain his plan to people by his uh, prophets and by his uh, infallible uh, imams. If we, if we can explain this theory, this way of justice to people people will continue, will, will follow the, the way of justice. They, 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 they will choose that. And they have responsibility to choose that. Uh, this is the summary of, of uh, the theory of justice, the human society. We have responsibility to accept, we have responsibility to know to understand what is the justice, what is the uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's way. We have to know that, we have to understand that, and we have to follow that. We have responsibility towards that. And there is no any, any uh, pressure against people to, to choose that. The last uh, thing would be uh, they asked Said Hassan, when the march would be for the atrocity that occurred this morning. So, so. It happened this morning. I'm not aware of anyone who has organized the march yet. I was saying, if you hear about it, make sure you attend. Even if you can't do it, then I give an alternative. Because we can organize one ourselves. Then we go positive because this is a new thing to run. Second part of the question was. Could you also let us know the name of the, the book about the rights of the offspring in Arabic? I'm not going to promote any particular book, but I would say if you can read Arabic, if you can read English. A Sahih al Sajjadiyya, compiled of the supplications of Imam Zayn al the son of Imam Hussein. Sometimes, with many, many copies, at the end they print the letter of rights, the Sahih al Kapuk, in Arabic or English. So some copies you can find that letter of rights, which includes the rights of many uh, different people within the society, including offspring and parents. So you can read uh, the words of the Imam himself. And I advise you to read his du'a for his parents and his own offspring, which gives you the meanings that he holds for them. So Sahih al-Sajjadiyya, within, within it there are two du'as, some copies the letter of rights is printed at the end. If you go on the internet, if it's Arabic, then any Arabic person like Arabic has it. Letter of rights. It's not a college. It's not a college, it's not a college. Islamic College, again, for you who want to read Arabic, has uh, translated a book. 
bunch of other maths, Australian maths here myself, uh, and English, and it has a couple of the lateral rights of the ones that are looking to it as well. Okay, I guess that's it for now, for our event. I thank one more, uh, one, once more time, uh, one more time, Azalal uh, Al-Kunze Hassan for honouring us uh, in our, uh, attending our humble, as I said, uh, event. Uh, thank you to everyone who attended today. Uh, I've been told that, told to advertise another two events as well. New Youth will be having the following event, I can't read it, it's, if I'm not wrong, it's this coming Saturday in Cricketwood, London, Dara Islam. And also, for those who are attending Imperial, Arab Society have uh, asked me to advertise. There's a charity dinner, that the, a formal charity dinner that we'll be, they will be having for the children of Iraq and Palestine. Once more, thank you for coming. and. Thank you for coming, I guess. Uh, my son. Salam.